Okay, good evening everyone once again and welcome to today's lecture on carbohydrates. And today we'll be going through some of the fundamental and the most important aspects of carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, you all know, they are the most abundant class of organic compounds which are present in earth. And they're widely distributed in different forms such as sugar, starch, cellulose, etc. So how we can define carbohydrate or what exactly is carbohydrate? The carbohydrates, they are polyhydroxyaldehydes or ketones. Or sometimes it can be the derivatives of the same. So what are carbohydrates? They are polyhydroxyaldehydes, ketones or their derivatives. Okay. So we know that from small classes we are learning like carbohydrates they are the major source of energy right so can anyone tell me like how many how much of energy we'll get uh, while consuming one gram of carbohydrate how much energy is there in one gram of carbohydrate four yes four. yes correct one gram of carbohydrate contains about four kilocalories of energy okay carbohydrates the major, which are the major elements in carbohydrates, it, it contains carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And the chemical formula of carbohydrates is represented by CX, H2O, Y. So with this introduction, we'll go into the classification of carbohydrates. Based on the source of origin, carbohydrates can be classified like fructose, maltose, lactose, xylose and cellulose. So we will see what is fructose. Fructose is our fruit sugar. Okay. And maltose, it is our malt sugar. And lactose, which is our milk sugar. And the wood sugar, which is known as xylose. And the sugar component, which is present in cell membrane, is cellulose. So based on source, we can classify carbohydrate like this. And we'll go into the general classification of carbohydrates. Generally, the carbohydrates are classified into three types. That is our monosaccharides, oligosaccharides, and polysaccharides. So in monosaccharides, you all know, there will be only one sugar molecule, right? In oligosaccharides, what is the condition of oligosaccharides? In oligosaccharides, there will be around 2 to 10 molecules of sugar, okay? And if the number of monomer units is greater than 10, then what we will call that saccharide, it is known as polysaccharide. So if there is only one monomer unit, we will call it as a monosaccharide. And if there are 2 to 10 molecules, then we will call it as oligosaccharide. And if the number of sugar molecules is greater than 10, we will call it as a polysaccharide. And we will see the details of each category of sugars. So are monosaccharides. So monosaccharides, they are the simple, simplest of the sugars, right? So that is, these sugars, they cannot be broken down into smaller units. Right? So monosaccharides are the simple sugars which cannot be broken down into smaller molecular weight carbon, uh, smaller molecular weight sugars, right? So uh, they are basically composed of a short chain of carbon atoms with either an aldehyde group or a ketonic group. So if the, a particular monosaccharide, it contains an aldehyde group, then we will call it as an aldose. Okay, if the monosaccharide contains a ketonic group, mm. then we will call it a ketose. Mm. Okay, so from the short chain, uh, in the short chain, if there is an aldehyde group, then we will call it as an aldose. And in the carbon chain, if there is a ketose, we will call it as a ketose. Okay, and again, we can further classify this monosaccharides based on the number of carbon atoms. So based on the number of carbon atoms, we can classify monosaccharides into trioses. 
Triosis means there will be three carbon atoms. Then we can classify into tetrosis. Tetrosis means there will be four carbon atom. Like that, we can classify it into pentosis, hexosis, etc. So that is one way of classification. So we will see which is the simplest, simplest monosaccharide. The simplest monosaccharide is a three carbon one, which is our glyceraldehyde. And another one is there, that is dihydroxyacetone. So these two are the simplest among the monosaccharides. Glyceraldehyde is basically a three carbon aldose. And dihydroxyacetone is a three carbon ketose. Okay, fine. So these are the simplest ones among the monosaccharides. We'll see the structure also. So glyceraldehyde, as, as we have discussed, it will be having three carbon atoms. And an aldehyde group, so OH. And here one CH2 OH group. Again, OH, H. This is a structure of glyceraldehyde. We'll also see the structure of dihydroxyacetone. This also three carbon, there is also a three carbon chain. Then a keto group. And here one CH2 OH. And here also CH2OH. So this is the structure of dihydroxyacetone. So these both are the simplest among the monosaccharides. So the most commonly occurring monosaccharide is glucose. We'll see the structure of glucose. So these two, D-glucose and L-glucose, these are the two enantiomers of glucose. So if you are seeing like here how uh, you, you might be uh, looking like how this D, D and L letter, that nomenclature came. So it is like we have to find out the chiral carbon atoms. So chiral carbon atoms means... Chiral carbon atoms is nothing but our asymmetric carbon atoms. So if you are looking into the structure, we can see one, two, three, four. Four chiral carbon atoms are there. Okay. So we have to find out the first chiral carbon atom. And then we have to look into the OH group. So in the chain, where is this OH group? This OH group, if it is present in the right side of the structure, then it is known as D glucose. And this group, OH group, if it is present in the left side, it is known as L glucose. So these are the two enantiomers of glucose. Okay. And uh, about the monosaccharides, all the sugars, they all possess a chiral carbon atom, except this dihydroxyacetone. Okay, from the number of chiral centers, we can find out how many stereoisomers are possible. So if there are n chiral centers in, an, in a compound, then we can tell like there will be 2 raised to n stereoisomers for that compound. So in this case, for glucose, how many chiral carbon atoms are there? There are 4 chiral atoms are there. Okay, so then the number of stereoisomers will be 2 raised to n, right? That is 2 raised to 4, that is 16. So like this, we can find out for a compound, for a particular sugar, how many stereoisomers are possible. Okay, so as discussed, based on the number of carbon atoms, we can classify the monosaccharides into different types. If there are three carbon atoms, it is known as a triose. And if there are four carbon atoms, it is known as a tetrose. And if there are five carbon atoms, it is known as a pentose. And for six carbon atoms, it is known as a hexose. And for seven carbon atoms, it is known as heptose. Okay. And this also based on the functional group. 
whether that CHO group is there or C double bond O group is there. Based on that also, we can classify. So, a three carbon aldose, example for a three carbon aldose is glyceraldehyde and a trioketose is dihydroxyacetone. And for four carbon ones, the examples are erythrose and erythrolose. And for pentose sugars, the examples are ribose, arabinose, xylose. And for five carbon ketose, examples are ribulose and xylulose. And for six carbon ones, examples include your glucose, galactose, mannose, and fructose. And for seven carbon ones, examples are glucoheptose and sedoheptose. So these are the major monosaccharides. And these monosaccharides are reducing sugars. Okay. Why they are known as reducing sugars? Because they can reduce CO2 plus ions and FECN three plus ions. Reduce. So in this reducing sugars means there will be some free aldehyde and ketone group will be there. And they, these P groups can be oxidized into corresponding acids. Okay. Okay, ma'am. So the reducing sugars, they can be oxidized into <laughs> sugar acids. Okay. And based on the extent of oxidation also, we can Based on the extent of oxidation also, the final product will change. And if there is only a mild oxidation, mild oxidation for the aldehyde group, then the final compound will be aldonic acid. Okay, and these, when both and the end of aldoses, they oxidize. Then we will get aldehyde acid. So that is, based on the extent of oxidation, the end product also will change. That is, if there is only a mild oxidation, the end product will be what aldonic acid. And if both the ends of aldose oxidizes, the end product will be aldehydic acid. Okay. And this monosaccharides, they are present in form of their derivatives also. And these are some of the examples for monosaccharide derivatives, which includes amino sugars, deoxy sugars, and glycosides. So these amino sugars in this, the oil group. It will be replaced by an amino group. An example for this is our glucosamine. Okay, so in amino sugars, what is happening? The OH group is replaced by an amino group. An example is glucosamine. In deoxy sugar, what is happening is like the oxygen atom. The oxygen atom is removed from a carbon atom. From a carbon center, an oxygen atom is removed. That is happening in deoxy, deoxy sugars. An example for this is L raminose. Okay. And the third one is glycosides. These glycosides, they are basically end products of Condensation reaction between sugar and non-sugar compounds. Okay, so which are the monosaccharide derivatives? Amino sugars, deoxy sugars, and glycosides. So in amino sugars, the OH group is replaced by an amino group. And in deoxy sugars, what is happening? An oxygen atom is being removed. And in glycosides, they are the 
condensation products of sugar and non sugar group okay is it clear yes ma'am okay now we'll move on to the next category of sugar that is our oligosaccharides so oligosaccharides they are basically formed by the polymerization of n molecules of monosaccharides and the value of n ranges from 2 to 10 okay and each of this monosaccharide units they are joined together by glycosidic linkages okay and based on this value based on this value of n we can classify the disaccharides into maltose based on the value of n we can classify oligosaccharides into disaccharides trisaccharides and tetrasaccharides and in disaccharides the common ones includes are maltose lactose and sucrose so maltose we all know which are the monomer units of maltose so maltose is formed by combining two glucose plus glucose uh, glucose molecules very good okay so maltose is formed by the linkage between two glucose molecules and there will be a linkage now as discussed so that linkage is alpha 1 4 glycosidic linkage and what are the what are the monomer units of lactose glucose and glucose and galactose yes glucose and galactose and this glucose and galactose they are joined together by beta 1 4 linkage and for sucrose what are the monomer units glucose and fructose yes very good glucose and fructose and this glucose and fructose they are joined together by alpha alpha 1 2 beta 1 2 linkages okay so these are the common example for disaccharide there is also another one example that is melibios which is formed by the combination of galactose and glucose and the linkage is alpha 1 6 linkage okay so these are the common disaccharides and one of the example for our trisaccharide is raffinose and the raffinose is formed by the combination of mono some units like galactose glucose and fructose okay so here the linkages are like between this galactose and glucose the linkage is alpha 1 6 linkage and between glucose and fructose the linkage is alpha beta 1 2 linkage okay fine is it clear Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Then I'll give an example for tetrasaccharide also. An example for tetrasaccharide is tachyos. Which is formed by the combination of two galactose molecules. one glucose molecule and a fructose molecule so stachylose stachyose is an example for tetrasaccharide okay so this is a structure of maltose lactose and sucrose so as mentioned in maltose this is one glucose molecule and this is another glucose molecule and they are linked together by alpha 14 linkage and this is a structure of lactose and this one is our galactose molecule 
this is our glucose molecule and they are linked together by beta 1 4 linkage okay and this is our sucrose molecule and they are linked together by alpha 1 2 glycosidic linkage so these are the structures of our common disaccharides now we will move on to polysaccharides so polysaccharides they are high molecular weight compounds right and they'll be having some greater than 10 number of monomeric units okay so can you give some examples for polysaccharides starch yes good starch glycogen glycogen cellulose hemicellulose pectin. all this yes pectin all these are examples for polysaccharides okay so we'll see the classification of polysaccharides polysaccharides they are basically based on the kind of monosaccharide present we can divide it into we can classify it into homopolysaccharides and heteropolysaccharides so we'll see what all are coming under this homopolysaccharides so our homopolysaccharides it includes starch right starch is there cellulose is there Inulin is there, glycogen is there, chitin is there. So these are some of the examples for homopolysaccharides. In starch, which are the monomer units? Glucose. Glucose. Yes, starch is formed by the glucose monomer units. In cellulose also it is D-glucose and in cellulose the linkage is beta-1-4 linkage and enulin it is formed from the monomer units of fructose and the linkage is beta-1-2 linkage okay and glycogen is similar to starch it is a branch branched chain polymer and in main branch the linkage will be alpha 1 4 and in branches the linkage will be alpha 1 6 that we will be uh, discussing in the further slides and chitin it is formed from the monomer units of n acetyl glucosamine okay so these are the major homopolysaccharides and heteropolysaccharides it includes our hemicellulose hemicellulose is actually a mixture of many sugars like xylose arabinose mannose and galactose then our mucopolysaccharides will be there Then our heparin is another example. Then chondroitin sulfide is another example. So these are the examples for our heteropolysaccharides. So this classification was based on the kind of monosaccharides, right? So we'll see based on the uh, structure, based on the what is the purpose of that polysaccharide, that way also we can classify it. based on the function of the polysaccharide we can classify them into storage polysaccharides and structural polysaccharide and examples for storage polysaccharides includes our starch glycogen etc and examples for our structural polysaccharides are cellulose chitin etc so these are the major classification of polysaccharides so till now we have discussed about monosaccharides oligosaccharides and polysaccharides now we'll see a pro, uh, question now uh, which has been asked in gate 2017 can you all go through this question and can you tell me which one is the answer for this question the question is indicate a correct group that contains a monosaccharide a disaccharide and a trisaccharide can anyone tell the answer of this question? 
option B. Yeah, option B. Very good. That is, you'll see all the options. So we need a monosaccharide, disaccharide, and a trisaccharide, right? So in the option A, what is glucose? Glucose is a monosaccharide. And in sucrose is a disaccharide. And mannose is also a monosaccharide. So in this option, ribose is a monosaccharide, lactose disaccharide, and raffinose is a trisaccharide. In this option also, mannose is a six-carbon monosaccharide, maltose is a disaccharide, lactose is also disaccharide, so that is also not option. Raffinose is trisaccharide, and statiose is a four-carbon uh, tetrasaccharide, and glucose is again monosaccharide. So the option is B. Ribose, lactose, and raffinose. Okay. So till this, uh, any doubts? No. Okay, then we'll move on to starch. So starch is one among the most important polysaccharide. So starch is mainly composed of two units. Which are they? Which are the two units of starch? Amylose and amylopectin. Yes, amylose and amylopectin. And the amylose, it constitutes around 25%, right? And the amylopectin, it constitutes about 75% of the starch. And now we'll see what is the structure, how the structure will be. And amylose is basically a linear polymer. Right? And what is up with amylopectin? It is a branched polymer. And if you are taking the number of glucose molecules in the amylose, there will be around 250 to 2000 glucose molecules. And in amylopectin, it is, it is around 15 to 25 only. Okay. And now we'll see what kind of linkage is there. So as discussed, this is the structure of amylose and the linkage is alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkage. And in amylopectin, we have two linkages. In the main chain, we are having alpha 1,4 linkage. And in the branches, we are having alpha 1,6 linkage. So these are the two linkages in amylopectin. In amylopectin, in the main chain, it is alpha 1 full linkage. And in the branches, it is alpha 1 6 linkage. Okay. So now we'll see what will happen if we are adding some amount of iodine into amylose and amylopectin. Okay. So we are going to add some amount of iodine. Okay. If you are adding some amount of iodine to amylose, its color will turn to blue color. Okay. And if you are adding some amount of iodine to amylopectin, the color will be a red violet. Okay. So that is how uh, amylose and amylopectin behaves to addition of iodine. We'll also see what will happen if we are adding some enzymes to amylose and amylopectin. So we'll see, first we'll see the influence of beta amylase. If you are adding beta amylase to amylose, what will happen is that
it will forms maltose okay and if you are adding the same enzyme to amylopectin then here maltose will be there together with maltose some amount of dextrin will also will be there okay so when we are adding beta amylase to amylose what is the end product maltose we will get some amount of maltose and if we are adding beta amylase to amylopectin we will get maltose and dextrin so what are these dextrins so these dextrins they are the products of partial breakdown of starch Okay, is it clear? When we are adding beta amylase to amylose, we'll get maltose, and when we are adding uh, beta amylase to amylopectin, we'll get maltose and some amount of dextrin. So dextrins they are the partial breakdown products of starch. Okay, and when we are adding, we see the action of another one enzyme also, which is glucoamylase. When we are adding glucoamylase to both the uh, amylose and amylopectin, it will yield D glucose. Okay, so while adding glucoamylase, end product is D glucose. So is it clear? Ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, yes. Ma uh, when we add iodine to amylose, it turns blue, and in amylopectin, it turns red to violet. But yes, red violet color it will be. Ma'am, any specific reason for this? It is because of the change in the uh, structure of the amylose and amylopectin. Okay. Okay, ma'am. So this is all about the starch. Then, two important properties of starch are gelatinization. And retrogradation. So, what exactly is gelatinization? So, when we, are, if you are taking some amount of starch, then we are adding water, and then we are going to heat it. So, what will happen? The starch it will absorb water. It swells. Right, then after some time, what will happen? It again absorbs water and it will increase the size. And finally, what will happen? The structure will break. And finally, this will be converted into a paste form. Okay, and this process is known as gelatinization. So, gelatinization is what? When we are heating starch with water, it will swell until it ultimately ruptures, collapses, and finally it yields a paste. And this process of swelling is known as gelatinization. Or we can define like gelatinization is the disruption of molecular order within the granules. Okay. So during gelatinization, uh, I don't like when we are adding water and heating. The intermolecular hydrogen bonds, it will break. Okay. When we are heating with the addition of water, what will happen? The intermolecular hydrogen bonds will break. And as a result, what will happen? The amylose content, it will leak out and the whole structure of the starch it will get changed and as a result bioreferencies of starch will be lost okay so gelatinization is a process of swelling of the granules by the application of heat so we'll see the what are the what, what is exactly happening during gelatinization? So this is a viscosity versus temperature curve for gelatinization of starch. See, 
this point number one. It represents onset of gelatinization. That is at around some 50 degrees Celsius, the gelatinization process will start. That is the molecules, it will start absorbing water and it will swell. The size of the size of the starch particle, it will increase as you can see in the diagram. Okay. Then as the temperature further increases the water or the starch molecule, it will again absorb water and at a particular point, it will reach the maximum intensity of gelatinization. And the corresponding temperature is around some 96 degrees Celsius. Okay, so at around 96 degrees Celsius, the complete gelatinization, we can tell like complete gelatinization or the maximum uh, intensity of gelatinization will be reached. And after this, what is happening is like the intermolecular bonds, they'll break and due to the enzymatic and shear destruction of starch molecules. So as, as a result, uh, the amylose content will come out and the starch will be broken down into small, small components. So as a result, there is a decrease in the viscosity. Okay. So this is what, ha what is happening during gelatinization. And the gelatinized starch When we are cooling, it will realigns or recrystallizes into thick paste. And this process is known as retrogradation. So, what is retrogradation? It can be defined as the reassociation or recrystallization of polysaccharides. And finally, what will be the results? The end product will be a thick paste, a gel-like paste. And if you are comparing amylose and amylopectin, the retrogradation occurs more readily with amylose than in amylopectin. Okay, why? Because uh, we know that amylose is having a straight chain, a small straight chain. But in amylopectin, there are so many branches. So the recrystallization it will take some time. So retrogradation is comparatively faster in amylose than in amylopectin, okay? And this retrogradation is the reason beh behind our bread staling. Staling, bread staling, you all will be knowing that is the firmness of the bread. That is when we are keeping bread for some longer period of time, uh, it will become dry and hard and it is not a staling. And the reason behind this bread staling is retrogradation. Okay, so that's about uh, starch, retrogradation and gelatinization. Now again, we'll see some of the questions which has been asked in the previous years from this part. And the first question is from Gay 2015. The enzyme that hydrolyzes starch into maltose is dash. Can anyone tell the answer? Is it alpha? Yes. Beta amylase. Beta amylase. Beta amylase is the enzyme behind the hydrolysis of starch. So this is another question from Gay 2016. So this just we have discussed. Bread staling is caused by? Retrogradation. Retrogradation. Yes, retrogradation, retrogradation. of starch. Okay, then what is this caramelization? Caramelization is also, caramelization is another one. Non-enzymatic, non yes. Non-enzymatic browning reaction of sugar when the application of high temperature. Okay, that is non-caramelization. The Latinization we have already discussed. And aggregation is nothing but the cluster formation. So the answer is retrogradation. And this is again another question from this retrogradation part. And this question came in gate 2012. The question is, 
reassociation of amylose and formation of crystalline structure upon cooling of cooked starch solution is termed as dash so what is the answer gelatinized it is a reassociation of amylose retrogradation yes yes it is retrogradation it is a reassociation so another one question this is from gate 2012 itself cellulose the structural polysaccharide of plant is a polymer of dash beta d glucose beta d glucose yes beta d glucose so that's all for uh, today's session today we had we had seen some of the basic aspects of uh, carbohydrate that is our classification of carbohydrates and some of the basic things about starch retrogradation and gelatinization in the coming classes we will be discussing more about the structure of carbohydrates there are different types of structure no we will be discussing about the structure of carbohydrates and about other polymers also we'll discuss about other polysaccharides we'll discuss their functional properties uh, all other uh, formation everything so hope to see you all in the upcoming sessions